Welcome to Arkansas Wildlife. Chances are, when you think of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, you think of wildlife species like deer, turkey, and ducks, or fish species like bass, crappie, and bluegills. But the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is charged with managing all of the natural state's wildlife. On this week's show, we're gonna look at some of those species that might not immediately come to mind. We're gonna start with a trip to the Cooks Lake Conservation Education Center to ban some hummingbirds. Our next stop will be the Grandview Prairie Conservation Education Center and Wildlife Management Area near Hope in Southwest Arkansas. We're gonna do some tagging of monarch butterflies. Our last stop is in the Ozark Mountains of North Central Arkansas, where we're gonna find out how our non-game mammal program coordinator keeps up with bat populations in the natural state. All that in this week's winner of an Arkansas hunting and fishing license right after this break. Arkansas Wildlife is brought to you in part by Academy Sports and Outdoors. For all, for less. Okay, baby, you can go. I'm going to tap the ball in the hand. <laughs> yonder he went. The natural state's smallest birds captivate and intrigue. But what is it that gives these little birds such a big stature in our hearts and minds? Call it charisma. They're small yet spunky, painted in some of the most vivid colors on Mother Nature's palette. And though they may not be as common as other Arkansas birds, we often find ourselves in close proximity to hummingbirds. But their charisma runs even deeper. These ruby-throated hummingbirds weigh just more than a penny. And yet, if we ate at the same rate as one, we would need to consume our weight in nectar plus 150 pounds of protein just to survive a single day. Its brain is the size of a BB, but somehow it stores a migratory flight plan that takes the bird on a journey covering thousands of miles, including a non-stop flight across the Gulf of Mexico to wintering grounds in Central America. These birds can remember the sight of their favorite flowers and feeders and can spot them from three quarters of a mile. It's no wonder we're fascinated. I have to have my desk with my back to the window. Otherwise, I'm gonna sit there and watch that feeder all day long. That comes from a woman who has actually touched thousands of hummingbirds. For the past five years, Tana Beasley has been banding ruby-throated hummingbirds at the Game and Fish Commission's Potlatch Conservation Education Center at Cooks Lake near Casco. We started our banding program in uh, the fall of uh, 2009, and from then until now, we've banded, well, we've banded around 3,000, at least 3,000 birds. The banding program started out of simple curiosity. Well, we always had lots of birds and our feeders were always full of birds, and we just started wondering, well, do we have the same birds that come back? The holder of the only federal hummingbird banding permit in Arkansas, Beasley works through the spring and summer to increase understanding of the birds' epic migration. If you get a permit, you have to have a project. So our project here was to decide or try to find out something about their migratory habits. Feeders attract the birds to wire bird cages. Usually two or three will start going in. And then as I move towards the cage, that'll usually move them towards the back. And they'll naturally start going towards the top. And I'll reach in there and, and cup them in between my fingers. Marlon Mowdy gently captures the birds and places them in a soft mesh bag. Inside the Education Center's classroom and laboratory, the Cooks Lake crew goes about the delicate work of placing a tiny aluminum band on the bird's legs. We're going to open each little band by using a number 13 tapestry needle. Nylon stockings secure the bird during the banding process. And basically we want to just get out the part of the body that we want to work with. And in this case, it's going to be her right leg. The bands are so light that you could theoretically mail 5,500 of them with one first-class stamp, so they don't hinder the bird's flight or other movements. Once the band is secured, the crew takes a series of measurements and records them along with the unique band number. These measurements, along with visible markings, 
help determine a bird's sex as well as its age. These small red throat feathers, for instance, indicate this bird is a hatch year male. Adult males will have full bright red gorgets, while mature females display white tipped tail feathers. Wear on feather tips show a female likely has nested this year. Because a female's breast isn't covered with feathers, a strategy for incubating tiny eggs, researchers can check for fat deposits to determine a bird's physical condition for migration. All of these factors add to our knowledge of hummingbirds, and over time, the recapture of birds here and in other places helps researchers understand migration patterns. After a quick shot of nectar, lapping with their tongues as fast as 13 times a second, the birds are released, buzzing away to contribute to our understanding of these fascinating little birds. But for Tana Beasley, that's not even the best part of her research. One of the neatest things is uh, getting to share this information with the public. This is part of what we do, is educate the people and help take care of our resources. Hummingbirds are, res are part of our resources. They also can be indicative of how well the environment is doing. And this is something else that, that we strive to try to help the, pu the public understand. When you think of animals migrating through Arkansas, you probably think of ducks or geese flying south for winter. But there's another winged migrant that passes through the natural state each fall on its way to southern wintering grounds. And yes, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission monitors butterflies, and one in particular, the monarch. Well, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is actually in charge of all wildlife. We are the trust agency for all wildlife species, and though you don't see butterflies on our logo, it is one of the things that we are tasked with managing. And the last 10, 15 years, there are a lot of populations of different butterfly and bee species that have been declining. The Rick Evans Grandview Prairie Wildlife Management Area in Southwest Arkansas provides an ideal habitat for numerous species of butterflies, and it's an important stopover point for monarchs on their way to Mexico. Grandview Prairie is our largest tract of native prairie that's left in the southwest part of the state. Grandview Prairie is actually a blackland prairie, which is a unique prairie type. It's got some unique flora and lots of butterflies because of all of the native uh, forbs and grasses that we have here. Grandview is also important for monarchs because they, monarchs, when they migrate south, they tend to follow what we call the I-35 corridor, which is in Texas and Kansas. So it's more of a westerly migration. And so the western part of Arkansas tends to see more of that fall monarch migration. In the spring, monarchs really are looking for milkweed. That's the only plant that the females are gonna lay their eggs on. And here we are at Grandview, which has a ton of milkweed. And so it's a great spot for monarchs. And in the fall, what monarchs really need are the nectar resources. They're traveling 1,000, 2,000 miles to get to Mexico. They need fuel. So they're gonna stop where they can find nectar. And at Grandview, 2,000 acres plus of native forbs. It's a great spot for them. In recent years, the population of pollinators from bees to butterflies has been in decline. There's a few reasons that we think monarchs are declining. One of those is increased pesticide use, increased herbicide use, climate change. Um, a lot of farmers now are cleaning out their, their farms. They're, they're cleaning out all the weeds that used to grow between the rows, and they're cleaning out the edges of the farm. So all of that weedy native growth is no longer there. Um, another reason that we attribute to monarch decline is the loss of milkweed, especially in the Midwest and the Corn Belt region. We're just not seeing the amount of milkweed stems that, stems that we used to have there. Studying monarchs requires keeping track of their migration and population. That's where the husband and wife team of Mike and Anita Briscoe steps in to volunteer. They've been tagging butterflies for more than 20 years. We had a uh attended a science workshop at Camp Clear Fort near Hot Springs and Dr. Jim Edson was one of the presenters and he presented a program. He was at that time the Monarch Watch coordinator for the state of Arkansas and he explained how people were 
catching the migrating monarchs headed back to Mexico and tagging them. We thought that sounded pretty interesting and kind of tie in with what we were beginning to do. So uh, he gave us some tags and we started tagging monarchs in 1997. Well, for one thing, it's helping out the monarch population, which has gone down over the past few years. They're trying to reestablish it to get it back up to its uh, highs like it used to be. And um, it's just fun to get outdoors. I don't hunt with a gun. I hunt with cameras and a butterfly net. But to me, it's just as much fun as somebody going out uh, hunting deer, duck, squirrels, whatever. That's uh, just what my wife and I would rather do. For the Briscoes, the butterflies also provide an educational opportunity in the classroom. The best thing about doing it is we're both retired school teachers and we still go back to schools and we did this while we were teaching. We would bring monarchs into the classroom, sometime in the egg, egg stage, sometimes in the larva stage, and we'd let the students watch the butterflies emerge from a caterpillar from an egg, then go through all of its instars, then form a chrysalis, then emerge and become a butterfly. Then we get to tag them, and the students would get to tag them. After the monarchs are tagged in Arkansas, it takes a little time before they arrive in Mexico. It's, you tag all the tagging season, which is in the fall, and then you have to wait until, what, March or April before you finally get the information. Some years you don't get any. One year we had four, and so that was a pretty big year to get four of them. The Briscoes say they hope their work contributes to an increase in the monarch population. You know, it's always the thrill of the hunt and the pleasure when you get what you're hunting for. And so, and it, you know, when you're doing this, you're being, being like a citizen scientist. You're actually helping because you're reporting what you found. Well, they're pretty for one thing, just the fact that they're so pretty and everything, but the main thing is they're one of our main pollinators. If we're losing bees, we don't need to be losing any other insects. And so we've got to figure out how to save all of them. At Game and Fish, there's also a renewed effort to increase the amount of habitat for pollinators. And good habitat for bees and butterflies is also good habitat for many game species. We really started to look at our habitat management and think about pollinators when we're managing our areas. Right now we're under a really big push for quail habitat and that plays right in with monarchs because they need the same types of habitat. They need those open prairies and open woodlands with native forb species and native grasses. And we're also doing a lot of outreach, uh, getting people to plant natives in their garden, uh, teaching people about maybe not mowing everything, maybe letting some things just sort of grow up and be natural um, and leave some of that good vegetation. It's really fascinating to think how far they fly. They fly 2,000 miles and they go to one little place in Mexico, even though they've never been there before those individuals are finding that one place in Mexico. So that to me is pretty fascinating. It's so fragile and you wonder how it flies like it flies. And just the complete change it goes through from the egg to the larva to the chrysalis and then becomes something entirely different from what it started. It's just I like a little miracle every time it happens. The monarch butterfly piece you just viewed was actually produced last fall, and this winter we got some good news. The monarch butterfly population overwintering in Mexico was the highest it's been in 12 years. If you want to help out monarchs and other pollinators, you can plant milkweed in your home garden and other pollinator friendly plants. Or if you want to check out Grandview Prairie, now is a perfect time to see the wildflowers in bloom on one of the best examples of black land prairie existing anywhere in the United States. For years, bats have been vilified in literature, TV, and film, forever linked with vampires. I am Dracula. Creatures of the night, feasting on blood. Vampires are at large, I tell you. Vampires. Bring some of this, Michael. Be one of us. It's caused an irrational fear of these flying mammals. Have you ever seen that? They're hideous. Lifeless beady eyes, clawed feet, huge grotesque wings. Wings! <laughs> 
four beautiful bats. In reality, there's nothing to fear. In fact, bats are an invaluable resource for both insect control and pollination. It's hard to tell exactly how many insects a bat will eat in any given night, uh, but you know, our best guess is it could be one or 2,000 uh, per bat. But it's a scary time for bats these days. Over the past decade, bat populations across the United States have suffered a massive decline from a fungus that causes white nose syndrome, which is spreading rapidly across the country. The, the fungus that causes white nose syndrome, what it does, it gets on the bats in the winter while they're hibernating in the caves and it grows on them and actually starts to you know, eat away the membranes of their wings and cause some physical damage. But the main problem is it seems to irritate the bat so much that they wake up. And when they wake up, they use the fat reserves they need to survive until spring. And they do end up starving to death. It's caused you know, just massive population losses of some species. Decked out in his emergency vest with traffic cones and a bucket in hand, Arkansas Game and Fish biologist Blake Sassy may look more like a highway worker than a bat researcher, but he's actually looking for bats in the concrete expansion joints of this state highway bridge. Today we're at this bridge that has uh, eastern small-footed bats living in it. Uh, you know, this particular species usually lives in uh, cliff faces or in the big boulder fields where they're really hard to get a hold of, but they've learn to use the crevices between segments of concrete guardrails in the bridges to uh, roost in during the day. Studying the bats in the bridges is pretty simple compared to a lot of other bat work. You just basically pull your truck over on the side of the road, uh, get a flashlight and walk down the side of the road looking in the crevices to find the bats. Um, it's a lot different than other bat work which pretty much takes place at night or in a cave. And I'm probably about the only bat biologist that gets sunburns on a regular basis from working out on these bridges. White nose syndrome has taken a toll on small-footed bats. Because it has been hit by this disease, you want to know how it's surviving, uh, it's, you know, how often it reproduces, and you know, actually just keep a handle on what's happening to the species here in Arkansas. Because the small-footed bat lives in these cliffs uh, most of the time, it's really hard to monitor their populations. But at these bridge sites, we can actually access them, count them, you know, see how many babies they're having and we put the bands on them to see you know, what their survival rates are over time to see you know, if they're being hurt by white nose syndrome here. This study involves taking a DNA sample from the wings of the bats to determine their relationship to different colonies. For the project I'm working on right now with the government of Canada, I've collected about 70 or so uh, samples from the small-footed bat, which will really be able to tell us a lot about how all these different populations are related to each other, and maybe a little bit about uh, uh, how closely related the bats within the colonies are to each other as well to indicate how often they move between them. Because if populations decline a lot due to white nose syndrome, how they move around in the environment is going to impact their ability to repopulate areas after you know, other ones have uh, died out. So we're collecting DNA samples from these bats to uh, determine how well related all the bats are across their range. They call it the eastern small-footed bat because their feet are very small in comparison to the other bats that we have. There are 16 different species of bats in Arkansas, and so far, the effects of white nose syndrome vary. Thankfully, here in Arkansas, the small-footed bat so far hasn't seemed to be hit by white nose very hard. The population seems to be about stable, but other bat species here in Arkansas have declined a lot. The tricolored bat, which is also a very common species, you'd see it in almost any cave you went to in the winter, there'd be a couple of them hanging on the cave ceiling. Now it's declined by at least 66% just because of white nose syndrome. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of solutions to manage the spread of the fungus that causes white nose syndrome. About the only thing we've been able to do to uh, slow the spread of white nose syndrome is to restrict access to caves uh, to people. And that will help you know, prevent big jumps of uh, white nose syndrome across you know, hundreds or even thousands of miles. It's not going to prevent the fungus from being spread by the bats. But even here in Arkansas, probably less than half the caves have the fungus yet, and we don't want it to spread to other caves any quicker than it has to. But there is a glimmer of hope for these creatures of the night. So I've been studying these uh, populations in the bridges for about five years now, and thankfully it appears that their populations are doing well, and I'm looking forward to you know, continue to keep track of these bats. Arkansas Wildlife presents the Watch and Win Giveaway. During each episode of Arkansas Wildlife, we'll give away an Arkansas resident hunting and fishing license. 
At the end of this season, we'll be giving away $500 worth of fishing gear with everything you need for outdoor adventures on Arkansas lakes and streams. It's all provided by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Visit the Arkansas Wildlife webpage at arkansaswildlife.com and click on the Watch and Win icon to enter. This week's winner is Donna Stoball from Clinton. Congratulations and thanks for watching.